First, we have Denise Maringolo. Dr. Maringolo is Associate Professor of History at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and Chair of the, of the Department. She is also the Vice President slash President-Elect of the National Council on Public History. Our second speaker is Emily Potter Jai. She is the Dwight and Kristen Poehler and Andrew W. Mellon Head of Education and Curator of Academic Programs at the Mead Art Museum at Amherst College. She joined Amherst College in 2018, coming from a public history background in New York City, where she worked on projects at the Brooklyn Historical Society and New York Historical Society, including the Muslims in Brooklyn Oral History Project and Brooklyn Abolitionists in Pursuit of Freedom. Our third speaker is Haley Singleton Hyde. Haley is the head of collections and operations at the Bonesky Museum of Natural History. Haley started at Amherst College in 2016 after stints at the National Park Service and the Florida Museum of Natural History. As you can see, our panelists bring a wealth of experience from doing public history at Amherst and beyond. One of the main reasons we are gathering on this topic of public history is to celebrate Dr. Maringolo's new book, Radical Roots, Public History and a Tradition of Social Justice Activism. This was published by Amherst College Press, and as such, it is an open access book. Although one can order a hard copy if you prefer, such as I have here, at the very least, be sure to download the book and make good use of it in your classroom, museums, and local history centers. Radical Roots is an edited volume comprised of 22 very accessible chapters and with an introduction and conclusion by Dr. Maringolo. The four main sections of the book range from answering the questions of where our history comes from and the origins of public history, especially pertinent to our other panelists today. Other sections cover museums and progress and cultural heritage as community building. As one might suspect, public history is a prime venue through which to understand our society, values, commitments, and aspirations. It is also a key component to building and maintaining a well-informed citizenry. At this point, I will turn it over to our panelists so we can discuss the urgency of public history and the role that institutions like Amherst play in furthering public history's commitment to community-centered potential. First up, Dr. Maringolo. Thank you so much for such a generous introduction. It's really an honor to be with you today, here with you today, and I'm very proud to have published this collection with Amherst College Press. So it's my job tonight to just establish some elements of a definition, to point quickly to a couple of examples from the book, and hopefully by doing so, to give us some context um, for this discussion this evening. So you just heard a little bit about me at, in the introduction, but let me begin by saying that first and foremost, I see myself as a public historian. I began my career as a museum professional, and I accumulated about 10 years of experience in museums and historical societies before accepting my academic position. I'm also a scholar of American social and cultural history, so my research is really dedicated to historicizing and theorizing community-centered forms of history making. So the accepted history of the field of public history tends to portray it as an inherently conservative um, um, process, growing out of an impulse to prevent change from happening. Yet many of my contemporaries see themselves as trying to promote change through the practice of public history. And so this impulse, I argue, also has deep roots in American cultural history and in the history of the field. So Radical Roots is the result of a large collaborative research effort to begin to identify the origins of that perspective. Um, 23 participants in this collaborative, they were academics, but they were also frontline interpreters, oral historians, and museum professionals. They were trained as historians, but they were also preservationists, artists, community organizers, performers, and a journalist. Um, and we came together to find examples in the past of something that looks like what we called radical public history. And by that, what, me, what we meant was purposefully counter narrative, actively politically engaged, or at least politically mindful, future focused, committed to the advancement of social justice, and engaged in the creation of a more broadly inclusive material record. So our task was really complicated by the fact that the term public history is fairly recent. So we couldn't look for people who were calling themselves public historians. We had to look for examples of work habits 
and philosophical orientations that now define the field for us. So that includes orientation towards non-expert audiences. It includes reflection on the relevance of history for understanding and addressing contemporary problems. It includes collaboration across disciplines and also collaboration with a variety of audiences and stakeholders. And that collaboration typically leads to what we call the co-creation of knowledge rather than a kind of top-down creation of knowledge. So there's no effective way to explore the history of radical public history in a single authored book, because public history is not a singular thing. It's a profoundly interdisciplinary field. It's practiced in many places, museums certainly, that's my own um, point of origin, but also in classrooms, in community centers, in historical societies, and elsewhere. And it most often really takes shape within a social network formed around a set of common questions or concerns. And that network is really most effective when it actively values diverse ways of knowing and accessing the past. So that means formal scholarship, but it also means lived experience, vernacular practices like genealogy or storytelling. So the collaborative that I helped form identified four areas of practice that we wanted to focus in our study. So that was public history education, oral history, museums, and grassroots preservation. So our goal was not to be exhaustive. The book, despite its length, is not exhaustive, um, but rather to be provocative, to open up new questions, to draw attention to absences, and to spark more inquiry rather than claiming to have had the last word on the subject. Um, Radical Roots, as ultimately published by Amherst College Press, includes 22 articles with audio ex excerpts and many, many links to videos and websites. It was really important to me and to the members of the collaborative for us to publish in an open access format because we wanted the final product to also be an act of radical practice. We wanted it to be multivocal as well as openly accessible to practitioners, whether or not they have exclusive access to a university library or the right to order a free desk copy. Um, I'm lucky to have found Amherst as the press was really making a serious and deeply ethical commitment to open access publishing. Um, I was asked to highlight a few of the uh, pieces from the collection, and that feels a little bit like trying to identify my favorite children, but I'm going to draw your attention to one from each of the sections. So the oral history section includes a piece by Kristen Anna La Follette, which analyzes a tradition of politically aware theatrical uses of oral history in the Latinx community. Um, she demonstrates that verbatim scripts have been used to engage audiences and actors in conversation about pressing political issues for a long time. Her work not only makes a case for the inclusion of oral history-based theater as part of the field's radical tradition, but it also argues that Latinx oral history practices broaden our understanding of the potential of public history to be overtly political. The public history section ends with a transcribed dialogue among five public history faculty members. That's Rebecca Amato, Gabrielle ben Bendenier Viani, Dipti Desai, Mary Rizzo, and me, all of whom integrate community-centered practice into our classrooms. So our conversation advances an argument that public history teaching is less about completing a deliverable or getting a grade and more about creating complex collaborative spaces, fostering meaningful dialogue, and addressing the kinds of systemic um, in inequality that can restrict creativity and undermine social justice. The museum section includes a reflection by Nicole Moore, who's an expert on interpreting slavery at plantation sites. And she describes both the personal sense of mission and the intense intellectual and emotional labor required to make radical interventions in museum spaces. And finally, the preservation section of the book includes an article by Laura Kelland, um, in which she offers a critical re-examination of the intersection between social justice organizing and community authored history. And other scholars have talked about that, the significance of that work in shaping the scholarship of social history, but Kellen really analyzes its impact in establishing social justice as a concern of public history. So those are just four examples out of 22. 
And so taken as a whole, I just want to uh, end this little introduction by saying the contributors are advancing several arguments about the origins, nature, and practice of this radical form of public history. Um, and I just want to highlight four super quickly. First is, however foolish this might be, radical public history is built on a foundation of optimism. Like you have to believe that public history is going to do some good in creating a more cohesive and inclusive community. Second, Radical public history has really long been infused by an anti-racist and anti-sexist worldview. And the ways in which this worldview has manifested in public history has certainly changed over time, but the ideas have nonetheless consistently framed radical practice. Um, third, radical public history is grounded in a belief that history making can and should be broadly relevant. And in that way, it is presentist. It is most effective when public historians are willing to facilitate dialogue about the persistence of inequality and about the systemic injustices that frame our institutions in order to connect past to present in ways that are useful. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly to me, radical is really contextual. So projects and perspectives that seemed radical and even achieved radical ends in the past may now seem limited or even a bit conservative from our perspective. And for that reason, such work has really most often been successful when it has resisted or limited permanent institutionalization. So, so sometimes it's most important for it to be temporary. So just a few very big ideas to help frame our conversation. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And I look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Marangolo, for that. Okay, now we're going to turn it over to Emily Potter Jai. Thank you, and good evening. And thanks again to, to Lloyd and Denise for that lovely framing of the topic and your work on this important book. Um, in my time tonight, I wanted to pick up some of those themes that Denise just brought forward, um, in particular, the co-creation of knowledge and interdisciplinarity. Um, and in order to do that, I'll share some of the museum approaches that we do here at the Meat Art Museum. Um, to also kind of acknowledge how we're paying homage to the public historians whose work precedes and inspires us. So backing up just a moment, um, I came into my professional identity as a museum educator um, doing public history work in New York City. Um, and in that time, I became very interested in collaborative curation and bookmaking projects with everyone from fourth graders to groups of older adults. And <clears throat> I came to understand and believe the power of collaborative historical work, um, that making an exhibition together or coming together to make sense of the archives or artworks is actually a really powerful space for practicing the world that we want to live in, um, <clears throat> not only for thinking about the content of it, but also how we treat each other and ourselves in pursuit of more truthful and fuller stories. So <clears throat> I find that public history is work that requires a real ego blasting empathy for yourself, for the other people in the room, um, for people who lived and made decisions in a very different past than we live in today, um, as well as the present, right? For the people who are, um, <clears throat> like, like Denise was mentioning, bringing in various levels, um, or not levels, but um, reference points, right? To the work and to the, even the idea of expertise, right? Um, and I love that you brought up optimism because I also think that this work is driven by a really earnest hope for um, more just and loving futures. So bringing us to Amherst College, uh, where I work now, me, the Mead Art Museum, for as many of you know, is Amherst College's 73-year-old campus art museum, housing a collection of over 20,000 objects with a real range in geography and time, um, time period. And one of the practices that I've um, kind of adapted from our work at Brooklyn Historical Society with co-curation um, is that idea of building um, collaborative curatorial projects with our students here. So <clears throat> I'm going to show some slides as I do this. <clears throat> In 2019, um, I co-led an exhibition course with visiting anthropology professor Amy Cox Hall. 
and we worked with 16 enrolled students to take the topic of food and eating and through that, a broad research and collaborative interpretive planning process to mount an exhibition over the course of the semester, which is about 15 weeks. <clears throat> so let's walk through the exhibition a little bit and I'll share along the way the decisions that the students had to wrestle with. And now, as visitors entered, the students wanted them to forget that they were even in an art museum but to really enter with a full sense of their body in the space and be able to access their own memories and cultural touch points. Um, to give you a taste of that, I invite you to enter this screen. You can even close your eyes because you're on a webinar, nobody can see you, as though you're really on a tour. You think of a strong memory you have with food. What made it so powerful? Was it who you were eating with or who you weren't eating with? Did you grow the food yourself? Did you transform it in someone's kitchen? Did it reflect a deep and vital sense of self, of cultural identity, your sense of family, gender, age, responsibility? So the Embodied Taste exhibition is equal parts interested in the art of food, of eating food, eating, culture, power through an anthropological lens, while also investigating food as a recurring theme and subject of visual art across cultures and times. And we used an array of media in six sections to think about food and art as political, cultural, social, sensual, and personal. So there's a link to a virtual tour that you're welcome to check out on your own, but I'll show you just a few of the most salient sections. Um, one of, once we got through the kind of large collaborative process of what, what the main ideas of our exhibit would be, we broke in the students into groups. And one group explored the range of emotions and context for eating alone versus eating together. They included poetry by Minnie Bruce Pratt, audio recorded over the Thanksgiving holiday week um, at their family and friend tables um, and events, Photo photographs and paintings that you can see here. And I wanna draw your attention too to the listening station that they set up. There was a real intentional dis decision to make the listening station both intimate yet communal. And so we used headphones with splitters so you could sit, it kind of encouraged you to sit with two or three people at a time. Here you can see an intergenerational group making use of it. Another section really showcases how the topic encouraged research across disciplines and collections. And so you see here um, in the case on the left, what Amherst College men, because it's a men's college at the time, ate in the early 20th century. <clears throat> There's loans in there from the library's archives and special collections of these elaborate banquet menus that Amherst students would have um, with the, you know, the odd foods that were eaten, um, but also just the like um, pomp and circumstance of this this printed menu and the font and the, the care and attention that went into it um, became something that our students were interested in thinking about. They also put Emily Dickinson's poetry here in direct conversation with this artwork on the right that many of you will recognize um, as related to Judy Chicago's dinner party. This is a, um, a study for the plate that was the Emily Dickinson plate and the full um, body of work from Judy Chicago is on view at Brooklyn Museum. <clears throat> Another group included students who were really active here on campus in the college's book and plow farm, which is a working farm, um, or some of them were involved in activism related to the conditions of dining hall workers. And so they really questioned and or were self-reflective about who they were writing labels for and what points of reference um, we as curators were assuming a museum audience member was bringing, right? So they, they wanted to really think, well, are people gonna identify more as consumers of food, as cookers of food, as growers of food, as shippers of food, right? Like thinking through the sort of social history of all of um, how food gets from farm to table. And so they put these artworks up with a label that kind of specifically asked people to, um, to think about and shine a light on their own sense of um, connection to those um, postures and smells and physical feelings. 
An interactive table here invites visitors to take a recipe or, and leave a recipe. So you can see the box with the recipes in it, um, as well as that uh, kind of diner slider card holder that held um, some directions and recipes that people would leave. There are scents, um, all of locally grown um, uh, foods and, and herbs in those salt and pepper shakers um, just to the top of the table. And then a diptych by the artist Lorna Simpson is kind of the featured artwork in this room as well. So connecting back to tonight's large inquiry and, and thoughts about public history, what is it? Why should, what is so special? You know, I always ask myself, why, why do I keep thinking collaborative exhibit making is so impactful and special? Um, it's a lot of work, right? It, um, it never goes the way you think it will. And that's of course, part of the point. Um, but here's some of kind of what my latest thinking on this is. For one, exhibitions are really public and creative sides of museums. And so inviting in more people to work on them also has the effect of changing the overall museum narrative um, and affecting visitor experience for more and more people. The um, process of doing this involved really expansive ideas of what is research, what constitutes the research you need to be able to mount an exhibition that will create a mood, a feeling, um, as well as um, research, you know, kind of more classical ideas of um, research or documentation. And so this photo here shows you one of the research trips we took was to New York City to go on um, a turnstile tours, food cart tour of Midtown Manhattan which um, involves a lot of tasting and eating, which is great, um, and also involves learning about kind of the working conditions of the various people, um, most of whom are immigrants who um, have carts and have to kind of deal with the bureaucracy in the city or um, governing food cart um, traffic. And that gave us also a sense of, well, who are the other people telling stories about food to broad audiences, right? And what are they doing? How are they doing it? Um, and what are the stories and what, what as visitors there did we experience and what can we carry forward into a museum? So it really did get at that sense of interdisciplinarity too. Um, also we'll say college students can be some of the most questioning um, of groups, right? They weren't here to replicate the status quo. And so it is obviously creates a really productive friction between museum practice um, or traditions and um, maybe the way we actually wanna be moving um, in the future. And so that, that was one thing that we enjoyed doing. So for instance, this was the first time that the Mead, maybe not all museums, but that the Mead had sent objects, interactive components and archives alongside artworks. And so that really opens the door then to kind of some creative ways of thinking about exhibition making um, at this museum. So clearly the museum has a lot to gain, but what did the students get from it? Um, I heard from students that this course was one of the hardest they'd taken, um, but that it also was very rewarding. There was a lot of talk about the alternative mediums for assessment, right? Like how do you grade this type of project and what does that do to their sense of, um, uh, yeah, of, of becoming trained and, and working towards their degree. There was a lot of talk about authenticity and why it matters. And that's why I highlighted this quote here that for many students, this was the first time working on something with such a broad audience. And that gave them a level of um, commitment and an ability to tap into really not wanting to do something that didn't feel in their gut as right, which was um, which I think is part of this, this work to be tuned in um, to this, what the scholarship is telling you, what, what people and communities are, are kind of the discourses, but also to build a really strong ethical core as well. Um, and then lastly, I think we started to see sources with a real, what I'll borrow from education theory of asset mindset. So instead of saying, what does it, in what ways is the source, um, you know, unreliable, we thought of it as what does a poem versus a work of contemporary art versus a historical painting um, that comes encapsulated with just reams of scholarship about it. What do these all have to offer? Because we they all do, they have something to offer in pursuit of this really like creating a thick and nuanced, um, inclusive and polyphonic history. So in very briefly to kind of make that point real for you, I'll share a set of photographs um, by Jonathan Marks Jackson that have engaged current students in discussions 
of history and anti-racism. Um, so here's a, a series by Jonathan Jackson called the House Servants Directory Portfolio um, that he made in 2019 when he was actually a senior here at Amherst College. Um, and if any of you don't follow Jonathan Jackson's work, please do. He's um, really a remarkable artist. Um, it's a series of photographic prints, um, over 20, all taken at Gore Place, which is a historic house in Waltham, Massachusetts. And Jackson created this project um, combining archival research and visual art practice as he came to embody questions about the limits and possibilities facing free Black New Englanders in the early to the 19th century. He actually found that his own fifth great grandfather, Robert Roberts, had become, um, who had become one of the first Black Americans to publish commercially with his 1827 House Servants Directory um, book, um, had this kind of incredible relationship to this place that was, um, you know, had for the most part told a very white centered history, um, historical narrative on their site, um, but had been, it was interested in changing that. And um, so Jackson went and uh, staged a series of photographs, um, and many of them putting his body into um, dialogue with the space and with this sense of history and past and present. Um, the Mead purchased this series in 2019 and exhibited it last year in conversation with photographs by Professor Justin Kimball, who is actually um, Jonathan Jackson's professor here at Amherst. And during that time, while it was on view, I worked with uh, history professor um, Betsy Herbin Triant for her course Slavery in U.S. History and Culture, and um, to use the the photographs to advance some of the key questions for her students. Um, in particular, how do images and ideas that developed during the slavery era continue to shape our lives, our culture, and our politics? Um, and through doing that, the students then really began to consider: Well, how might art and in particular contemporary art address the gaps in the archives between what is recorded and what is true. Um, and as in creating that, um, I also drew from Rachel Matson's concept of tactical heuristics from her work in this wonderful book, History as Art, Art as History. Um, and the students used the time together in small groups to actually um, collectively craft research questions. And um, we're really connecting to the present and to conversations around um, anti-racism and the college as well. And so a really un un um, anticipated outcome was that uh, one of the students in the class was from the women's hockey team who had been doing a series of dialogues as a team on race and racism and asked to come back and do the same thing again. And so we got to, from this one uh, incredible you know, art project have, have really um, inspired a lot of conversation um, that continues to live on in various ways. So as a museum educator, I'm always more concerned with questions than answers. So I think I'll leave you there and hopefully I've sparked some ideas or questions for you along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily, for that. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and turn it over to our next panelist, Haley Singleton Hyde. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure to have sort of a deep dive into public history. Um, my name is Haley Singleton Hyde. I'm the head of collections and operations at the Beneski Museum of Natural History. Um, I often say uh, an easier title for my job is a librarian of fossils. So I'm actually coming from what I consider more the back of house um, in a museum in that I often deal with objects. So I actually felt a little naive coming in and I, I thought, oh no, I'm not really, I don't really, practice public history, um, but that is far from the truth. I actually have a lot of background in museums and then I worked for the National Park Service for a number of years. And often my job was to interact between researchers 
to communicate with the public about research and science. And so in that regard, I really realized, oh, I actually have been doing this for many, many years and just never thought about my role as a public historian. And I actually absolutely believe I belong here now. Um, so to start things off, I just wanted to talk about a little bit more about my background. Um, I started at Amherst College in 2016. That's actually the 10 year mark of when the Bineski building was built. Um, this uh, entire process of learning about public history got me really interested in how the building was perceived in the past few decades and then also how um, the museum has been uh, a part of campus for so long. I'm often, like I said, I'm often thinking about objects and their description and I'm not often um, receiving visitors in the community. And so this gave me a really good opportunity to deep dive into that. So I'm going to share some slides here to discuss um, further. Let me make sure I'm in my mode here. Um, this interview, there we go. Share, there we go. So, like I said, I started in 2016, and that was actually the 10 year anniversary of the Bineski Museum being in this building. Many of you have probably visited campus um, and gone on a tour or um, just visited the museum in general. Um, and that is a part of our day to day here. We often have numerous tours, community groups, classes coming through. And because of our building design, it's very unique in that our offices and our classrooms are embedded directly in the building. So even if you don't wanna interact, you are often um, interacting in all ways, shapes and forms. And so even though I'm often um, working with the fossils or the exhibits, I also am interacting with the public. Um, and the other part that I got really interested in during my research on public history in the museum here was how are visitors experiencing the museum in the past 150 years of it being on this campus? I'm like I said, I'm often doing research around individual fossils or specimens. And so I'm not really thinking about how the museum was perceived through history. So that got me, um, thinking about how these buildings were used on campus and how is the museum and how the visitors in the 1800s into the 1900s may have experienced the museum. Um, Amherst College has had some form of natural history museum since the 1830s, um, beginning with Edward Hitchcock collecting fossil trackways and storing them in the octagon. Um, and then the most, uh, the intentional museum was first built and it was Appleton cabinet. Um, and that was a really interesting space because we actually have some evidence that a number of visitors were visiting per year. Um, and that was something new to me. I didn't really ever think, you know, most of our pictures, like the one you're seeing here, it doesn't show anyone visiting. It's just an empty photo of the exhibit hall. So it really got me thinking like, what are we missing in our dialogue and our historical knowledge of the museum? It just felt like something was missing. It's almost like almost ghostly in a way of here's what we know. We know these halls existed and we know that now some of them have been reused in these new ways. So we have Pratt Hall, for example, is now a dorm and Webster is also a, a building where there's offices and classrooms. So just thinking about these spaces and how community members in the 19th and 20th century were coming into these buildings and onto the campus and experiencing science. That was something that I just never really uh, let myself run wild with, you know, there's a, there's a huge chance that Emily Dickinson came into Appleton cabinet. We know she was taking some of Edward Hitchcock's lectures and had some of his books and was with, you know, learning from Aura White. So there's, there's a high chance she visited the museum. So I just started really envisioning what it would have been like to kind of go back in time, but not go, you know, not be too deep about it. Um, there was another, um, really interesting facet that was, um, thinking about how the students on campus were using the museum at that time. And I thought this quote really, um, this part of this quote was, the grand object is to afford students an opportunity of seeing and examining systematic collections of all the animals and plants that now live or have ever lived upon our earth. A secondary object of a ca college cabinet and one of no small importance is to afford transient visitors much valuable knowledge. 
And I found that really fascinating to think, oh, we were not only we were trying to educate students on this campus, there was a pretty broad understanding that another goal of these museum spaces was to educate the community and have other people come into a space. And I kept picturing these larger, you know, we often think of the large museums like the Field Museum or the American Museum as these large kind of behemoths of museums. And in fact, we had a similar visitation and almost more access. The other part that was interesting that he mentioned was that people were spending hours in the collection. They were also, you know, the cabinet was in, it was open at all hours of the day. It could be visited at all, any time and for free of charge. And that is something that we've carried into now that is presently happening in this space. Um, I also kept thinking about many of our alums likely visited the Pratt Museum. And that's an experience I never got. I'm not from this region. And so I often, if someone comes in and says they uh, went to the Pratt Museum, I often want to hear about it. Um, and it wasn't always um, given the best glowing review. It was sort of dusty and dim. And so it was really interesting to come into a new building um, in 2006 and have this juxtaposition of then and now. We really had this, these same fossils that were often stowed away or in a, a dusty basement now are part of the learning experience of college students that come to campus today. I found that just so interesting. Um, on the left is a group of Amherst College summer interns from the three college museums. They did some tight site tours. This was pre-pandemic, so I guess summer of 2019. Um, and this was something that informed their projects and their practice and also their engagement with the community. Many of our students that work at the museum, they engage fully with the community. Um, and the building itself now where we are housed, the Bineski building, it was designed really intentionally around creating an open feel where their museum is actually integrated into the classrooms and the laboratories. So that's a really rare thing. Usually when you go into a museum, the, the exhibits are really tight and they're sort of siloed off. You're not you're not walking out a door in and seeing a laboratory, you know? I mean, they're starting to get a little better about that. Sometimes you can go to like the Field Museum and they'll be preparing fossils more visibly, but that's a really new thing that we actually like integrated in 2006. And I found that really great. Um, so you often have sort of these run-ins where the students are in the hall, but also we have visitors in the hall and we'll have classes of elementary school students, you know, causing a ruckus downstairs. So there's always, um, I just love that there's kind of this intergenerational, notion that happens in the Bineski at all hours of the day. Um, and we're also, we're still very free and open. And in this picture, you can see there's all generations of folks visiting and our education team, which is mostly Amherst College students, they tailor their tours towards those groups. So if it's a group of small children, they will give an individual tour at that level, which is not something you would always get at a larger museum. It's usually what you see is what you get. And here we really make that happen. Uh, I'll, I'll give a shout out to our educator, Fred Venn. He will make it happen for you day or night, I promise. Um, the other thing I wanted to discuss today is how the museum is often used for student-centered work and community practice. On the left, that is a geology class that uh, came in uh, earlier this year. They were using software to develop 3D models, which can then be printed and used in educational resources. So they literally are measuring the saber-toothed cat using their cell phones, creating a 3D digital model. And that model can then be printed and used in educational resources. So it makes objects really handleable, which is a tactile experience that I really love giving people because as someone who kind of guards objects sometimes from breaking, having something that a student or a, a child can hold and not break is really, really important. Um, we also just recently had a student create media, um, made us a YouTube channel. Thank you, Ben. Um, and he created tours geared towards the Bineski's track room that you can go in and access really easily and um, see these areas of the museum. Uh, through media on YouTube, which I found great. We do have a little bit of limitation here. We're challenged sort of by when we were built in 2006, it was really geared towards like our exhibit labels are geared towards the college level. So often, um, and our audience is, some, is mostly children and the elderly and other, and other community groups. So part of the job of our students and our education team is to create distilled information. 
So, and I, sometimes I do that in my practice too, because I often interact with researchers, it's really dense material. So sometimes I see myself in that public history role where I have to read this really intricate paper about a new fossil, and I have to make that into a digestible bite. And that's exactly what our students are doing day to day. Um, and I'm gonna end with a plug. Um, and it's actually for a public history event that I would consider uh, very centered to that. Um, we often receive a load of questions about objects that people find. Uh, community members sometimes even bring them in on days when uh, you know maybe one of us can't answer questions. So we're having a designated day where the public can come in, bring something they found that's important. We will have geology students and other experts, including paleontologists, to look over your finds, facilitate, facilitate your questions, and we can tell you a story about that object. It's great. It's much better than you sending me a photo because I probably can't identify it that way. So please come in. It's free. It's open to everyone and it will be on Sunday, October 30th. So come and thanks. Thanks again to everyone who helped put this together. I really appreciate it. And I'll kick it back to you, Lloyd. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Haley. Okay, uh, we have 17 minutes left, so uh, we, sh we should go straight into our Q&A se uh, Q session here. Um, we'd like to invite members of the audience to submit your questions for the panel. You can look at the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Okay, so while you uh, type up your questions, I just will note a few uh, cross-cutting themes. Let me start with number one. Public history is hard. Um, what I mean by that is not that it's a daunting task per se, but it does require hard work, um, attention to details. And along that same line, I would suggest that public history behooves us as communities to do some real soul searching, or I guess to use a more appropriate metaphor for New England, um, for Puritan New England, some introspection, right? We ask questions about ourselves. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, what are, our, what are our hopes, our values and aspirations? And also, I get the sense that public history pushes the conventional practices of history, methods of history. It expands our paradigms of what history is. And more importantly, how do we translate the pedagogy or how do we translate the, the theory of history into pedagogy and practice? And I won't say much more. I do want to maximize time for questions. So we can start with a question here, uh, starting with uh, what are challenges and opportunities for doing public history work within museums? and sites that are actually part of the academy. And that question pertains to uh, all of, of what was spoken of today. Anyone want to volunteer to go for that? Or we can have several individuals, of course, uh, respond. Um, we're all fighting over who will go first. Um, <laughs> such a juicy topic, right? I think I can, this is exactly the question that I wrestle with of working within a campus art museum, um, right? And I think to me, there are a couple of questions of how students um, who are one of our core audiences and constituent groups experience research in the museum and what we're asking of them and then how they experience what is being asked of them to get a degree right from this um, from this place right that has certain um, expectations assessments and I think there is a wide impulse for us to be um, or for me at the museum to kind of be be more focused on um, some outcomes at as you know, did your exhibition touch people, move people's minds, right? Touch their hearts, make them get to know themselves and their, you know, elders better. Did it do these things? But that's not always what um, students also sometimes need to be getting a grade and finishing labs and, you know, have, working a bunch of jobs. And so I think just kind of like practically speaking, there's um, when we involve students as workers um, and we, we have a habit like, we don't, um, we don't have like unpaid internships. We always compensate students and, um, you know, or work in this within the framework of courses and things. 
um, I think just the competing priorities, right? Because of how to like nurture and provide that mentorship to students while understanding that their lives are driven by a whole, they've got a whole bunch of things they're negotiating that, that are a bit different than us as um, just full-time museum workers. There, that's a start. Excellent, thanks for your answer, Emily. So you should feel free to refer back to that question. If not, we can add some others to the hopper. So we have a question from someone in the audience who's asking, how does public history change historical methodology? Any takers? Yeah, I think this is a really great question um, about method. And I always tell my students that the trick is to figure out what is the added value of history in a particular situation. So I'm actually asking my students to value the methods that we teach them in a history program, but to think of them as tools that you can use in a community. The one way that I do, well, there's probably more than one, but the one that I always talk about that I think is a way that public history um, changes methodology a little bit is that sort of traditional historians, whoever those are, tend to be solitary workers and they tend to develop questions. The, the way you develop a historical question if you're a professional academic historian is to go to the scholarship and see what other historians have written about a topic and figure out where the hole is. But that's a very closed conversation, right? Like most people are not aware of these scholarly debates. And that's why sometimes when a scholarly debate kind of seeps out into the media, everyone gets up in arms about it and says, oh, you know, this is a revisionism, but that's the nature of history making is revisionism. So I say that the difference in public history is that the inquiry starts with collaboration and it comes from the people. It doesn't come from the scholarship because that's how you make history relevant. Then you're still using the same tools. You're still using the same methodology. It's just that your point of origin and your point of inquiry comes from a different place. Thank you, Dr. Moringalo. Emily or Haley, do you wish to take that one up or shall we move to another one? I thought that was an excellent answer. Yeah, I think we can move on. Same. Yeah, same All right. here. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, this is actually aligned with something that Dr. Moringalo had just mentioned. Um, Someone from the audience wants to know, how are your collaborations reflecting interconnections be between communities? Or we can ask, you know, what are ways in which, you know, the collaborations that we have established or future collaborations we're planning for uh, reflect, uh, again, interconnections between communities. I don't want to be the only one talking and I'm looking, I'm <laughs> eyeing the two of you, like what's happening? Are you going to say something? I guess I don't really, I'm not sure exactly what the question is pushing towards, um, but I guess that I'll say that one of the things that we are, are working on all the time at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County and within the National Council on Public History is, is thinking about what an ethical collaboration looks like. And mm -hmm. so, and by the way, while there are certainly some things that you want to bring with you across collaborations, it, it's actually different every time because every collaboration is unique and every community is unique. And so I don't know if this is exactly the question, but I think one of the things that we think a lot about is as much as we want to walk into a place with humility and not like walk in as like the expert historian to the rescue, um, we're really, we're, we're we can't uh, deny the fact that as academics or as people coming from university, we're walking in with some privilege. And so taking, taking time to be transparent about that and to talk it through with the community and figure out like where that's a barrier and where it may be a help is, is a way to create new connections across communities. Not exactly sure that was the question, but. Yeah, I was gonna speak to, oh, go ahead, Haley. Yeah, I, I actually, I think I had a, an example I meant to bring up in my talk today, but I, I think I neglected it. But one of the things I, 
I was thinking about is like who sometimes is not coming into our museums um, and um, why, right? Um, we actually have a student who I think this project is just starting uh, today who's going to work on creating some bilingual content for the Beneski Museum because right now if you walk in there's there's no um text in any other languages so it, even if you want to find the bathroom and you don't know English like if you don't speak English like it's a it's a barrier to you to come into our museum so I think thinking about different communities and how we are serving them and who who's not being served well is a really important part of at least museum work um I don't know if I could speak exactly to like the community aspect at large but I think that that who who we're not serving is something that is top of mind for many museums and how we need to better serve certain communities. Yeah, I would just add, I think intergenerational work is really important to me. I think there's, and thinking about it as multi-directional, right? You can always be learning from people older and younger than you. And um, so I wanted to maybe speak to the work that my colleague Olivia Fayal does at the Mead through our K-12 partnerships, because they bring um, Amherst College students who are interested in education and pedagogy. Um, she works with them to develop their skills as, as student museum educators. Then they work with in the schools, actually doing um, programs that are part in the schools. And when we're open, part in the galleries, um, where there's a construction project that has prolonged our COVID-related closure. Um, but these projects with with um, uh, like first and, and fifth grade students, they learn about um, social studies curriculum, sustainability curriculum, visit the farm here on campus, create artworks related to um, what they're thinking about seed, um, kind of seed heritage and their own um, uh, social studies learning around food. I promise not everything I do is about food. I just realized we brought up another food example, but we do other things at the meet also. Um, and then the the Olivia creates a book actually of that puts some of the artworks that the um, ch the school children have been studying um, in on equal footing with the artworks that they've made. And this is a real collaboration with our college students who get to um, kind of learn what it means to be in practice with um, professional school teachers. So it's such a great um, experience. Um, children love working with college students. Like there's that just the desire to be around young adults. Um, so it's it's just this like really lovely collaboration. Excellent. Thank you all for the answers. We have another question from the audience asking, what role does a place like Amherst College have in community-based public history projects in the local community? Or how might the college partner with local organizations interested in public history? So we could think Amher specifically, or uh, Denise, if you have uh, answers from your uh, your own uh, context there in uh, Baltimore. Yeah, we, I mean, it's not an Amherst answer, but this is like the kind of center of my work. And not only my work, there are other faculty members at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, who, who do serious collaborative work with communities. Um, I think, again, sort of one of the things we're thinking about is how to make sure that that's deeply ethical how it, because one problem could be that a that a faculty member or a group of students go into a community and they're kind of extracting knowledge from that community or seeing that community as like the subject of their research but that's not collaborative community-based work um and so what i tend to do is work through an organization that already has a community relationship because it's really hard to establish working relationships and build trust. And there's always a lot of distrust between communities and academic organizations. So I've built up relationships with community groups and that way that relationship is the stable piece and then students come and go and community members come and go but I've got working relationships and I because I'm a historian I'm working with historically sent historical organizations but some of my colleagues work with um, community development organizations and other groups like that so I think that is really the important thing is building trust finding an organization that has the community relationships and being humble and not being extractive, like actually listening to what the community needs and making sure you're returning that work. And also listening to what the community wants to have happen with the research. They may not want it to ever be public and that's fine too. They, they need to be in the driver's seat as opposed to faculty being in the driver's seat. 
Well, thank you, Denise. Emily or Haley, do you want to speak to that within the Amherst context? I think we have just a probably two and a half minutes at this point, so a quick answer, if anything. I think there's some really important offices, right? That I would that I wish were here to answer it. Um, and so instead of answering the question, I'll just name that um, that Mike Kelly's work and Brandon Castle's work in archives and special collections, especially with the um, collection of Native American literature, um, they're they're doing a lot of that work. Um, yeah, with a strong sense of what is the ethical way to do it. And then the Amherst College Center Center for Community Engagement, led by Sarah Barr is also um, thinking in similar ways on a lot of projects. Um, I think it's a newer venture for the Mead. Uh, we have an exhibition coming up in 2023 that's a collaboration with the Kim Waite Eisenberg Collection of Native American Literature at the library that's guest curated by Hyde Erdrich and that has um, an advisory council that um, that is kind of, we're learning a lot and trying to build some new ways of working as well as a campus art museum. Excellent, thank you, Emily. And finally, just perhaps quick tips. Someone would like to know how they can uh, get in touch and connect with um, other community-based amateur public historians. Is there a resource that you all go to to make these connections? You could join the National Council on Public History. I'm just saying that that is one <laughs> possibility. I would also say in Baltimore, actually, um, we kind of worked with the historical community and we hold an annual unconference so that anyone who's interested in local history, we, we kind of work through the historical societies and not even the formal historical societies sometimes, just like groups that are just interested in history. And we all get together and talk about possible projects or stuff we're working on. And that's been really, really effective. So, I mean, unfortunately the answer is you might have to make your own <laughs> community mm -hmm. and point of entry. Such is the nature of such uh, grassroots work, right? <laughs> okay, we are just about out of time. And so uh, we'll go ahead and just call it a night at this point. And thank you all very much. Why don't you join me in giving our panelists a round of applause? It, I can hear it here in Amherst and hopefully you can hear it out in Baltimore. <laughs> all right, thank you all. Have a good night.